we are reading from chapter 19 of uh, AMP, Cardiovascular System, and right now we're going to be focusing more on the red blood cells, aka erythrocytes. Now, there, most of your blood is actually red blood cells in comparison to the other two, other two formed elements, the white blood cells and the platelets. We know that red blood cells cannot move on their own. They can only be carried along in the current of the blood. So, here is a red blood cell. The red blood cell is skinnier in the middle, so it looks kind of shaped like a little bit of a donut, sort of. And because of this shape, it is able to bend and fold at the center so that it can easily squeeze through tight spaces or if the veins um, are constricting or getting smaller, these guys can bend and change their shape in order to get through tight spaces. Other thing you need to know is that what makes them red is the pigment called hemoglobin, which is a protein. Protein um, here, this, this is what a hemoglobin molecule actually looks like. It's made up of two parts, a heme and a globin, hence the hemoglobin. So here what we have here is the globins are these wormy globular looking things and the hemes are these little discs. So each hemoglobin, hemoglobin protein molecule contains two globins, the orange part and the red part are two globins, and each hemoglobin molecule also contains four hemes. So per one hemoglobin there's four hemes and two globins right here. So this is important because the function or the purpose of a red blood cell is to deliver oxygen to the tissues and to the cells and also to transport the carbon dioxide as a waste product away from the cells and carry it back to the lungs where we can exhale and get it out of our bodies. So how does it do that? Well, the oxygen is actually going to attach to the heme groups. So any, any one given hemoglobin can deliver up to four oxygen molecules per hemoglobin. So one, two, three, four oxygen molecules at a time. Now once the hemoglobin delivers that oxygen, it is now free to carry carbon dioxide away from the cell as a waste product to the lungs. And the, and the carbon dioxide attach to the globin so they can carry two carbon dioxides back and away. Now, one of the important things um, required for building hemoglobin is iron. Kind of like you need wood to build a house. If you don't have iron, you can't really build or have hemoglobin um, just because that's one of the ingredients. Now, um, they talk about something called hemolysis. Now, hemolysis, the root word here, heme, has to do with formed elements, and red blood cells are a formed element. So whenever you see the word heme, you know we're talking about either a red blood cell, white blood cell, or platelet. So hemolysis, referring to the lysing, or the breaking down, or um, collapsing, breaking down, degrading of, of this formed element. So hemolysis is the breakdown of red blood cells. And to a point, this is normal. Everyone's red blood cells die eventually, and your body has to constantly be making more. So, um, when hemolysis is a problem, is in cases like hemolytic anemia, where um, anemics are having problems with their red blood cells, maybe they're dying too quickly and they can't replace them fast enough, or something is wrong with them and they're not working properly. Um, so, one of, the, one of the things that anemics have problems with is sometimes they have an iron deficiency. And if you don't have iron, we know that you can't build hemoglobin. And if you don't have hemoglobin, you can't have functioning red blood cells. And without red blood cells, you can't deliver oxygen to your tissues. So you'll just feel generally tired and out of breath. And that's why um, sometimes anemics are like that. They feel tired all the time. Um, one of the things an anemic can do, though, is take iron supplements or vitamin C supplements. Because here it says that stomach acid and vitamin C in food increase iron absorption. So the problem might not be that you're not eating enough iron. Because even if you're eating enough iron and having supplements and everything else, if you don't have adequate vitamin C, you won't be able to absorb the iron that you are actually getting. So these two go hand in hand. You need to have both in order for it to work. <clears throat> now back to um, the carbon dioxide, which gets transported in the globin. This is an important part. I remember um, taking a test, and this was one of the questions. And I always remember the questions that I miss, and this is one of the questions that I missed, so I'm having an emphasis on this. 
it says that carbon dioxide is transported in the blood in three major ways. We talked about one of them already. The first one being that the carbon dioxide attaches to the globin. Now, there's two other ways. Approximately 7% is dissolved in the plasma. So, if we go back to this picture, and here's the f this is your blood. We remember that over half of your blood is actually just plasma, which most of that is just water. So they're saying here that about 7% or so of the um, of your carbon dioxide is going to dissolve in this plasma or in the water and get transported through the blood that way. And that's what this 2% of other solutes accounts for. It says gases being one of those other solutes that could be in there. So, so the first way, could 7% is dissolved in plasma. Approximately 23 is combined with the hemoglobin, as which we discussed earlier, where the, the carbon dioxide will attach to this globin and get transported back on the red blood cell. And the last one is that 70%, this is the majority, the vast majority, and I remember this one, is that it gets transported in the form of bicarbonate ions. And I'm not a chemistry person, so I don't really know too much about all of this, but basically what happens is these bicarbonate ions are produced when carbon dioxide mixes with water and they combine to form this other thing and blah blah blah. Basically you don't need to know this, you just need to know the three different ways and which one is the most. So just remember that in the form of bicarbonate ions is the most prevalent of the three options. Let's see. Now back to the hemoglobin. Now a person can identify or classify or give a name to a hemoglobin depending on what it is carrying. So if we look at this first vocab word, it says oxyhemoglobin. Now let's pretend that this hemoglobin is carrying oxygen to the cells. So oxygen would be all attached to this. This is what you would call an oxyhemoglobin, hence oxy, because it's containing oxygen. So this oxygenated form of hemoglobin is called oxyhemoglobin. The next one is deoxyhemoglobin, and it is generally what you would suspect after the hemoglobin delivers the oxygen to the cells and drops off the oxygen, it no longer has oxygen on it anymore and it's not carrying anything. So it is called deoxyhemoglobin. Now, when hemoglobin is transporting carbon dioxide um, in one of those three options that we mentioned, it will be attached to the, glo to the globin. And that one, a hemoglobin that's carrying carbon dioxide, will be called a carbaminohemoglobin. Just look at the root carb for like carbon, monox carbon dioxide. Um, let's see. Um, the last one is carboxyhemoglobin. Now this one is bad. Um, I don't know how many of you have maybe heard of carbon monoxide poisoning, but you know it's like when people get locked in the garage and the car is on and the exhaust pipe um, is having all the fumes. People inhale it and they die. So what happens is the carbon monoxide is um, an is a uh, going to compete with oxygen for these heme sites. The carbon monoxide and the oxygen both want to attach to these. So what ends up happening is the carbon monoxide wins, kicks oxygen off, and attaches to this. So this, the red blood cell thinks that it's delivering oxygen to the cells, but it's really not. It's delivering carbon monoxide. And you need oxygen to survive. You need it to for your cells, you know, to have a metabolism, to have energy. And so what ends up happening is basically you suffocate and the hemoglobin is no longer able to transport the oxygen. So this is um, can end up with different, um, what do you call it, side effects as like headache, unconsciousness, and even death if it gets to be too severe. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the life cycle and the history of a red blood cell. Well, they don't live forever. You know, they die eventually. Um, so in... Even when you donate blood, you have to be constantly ma making more. So back to the production of red blood cells. We kind of mentioned this earlier in an another video. This whole process here is showing you how, t from a stem cell, how they can turn either into a red blood cell, all the different types of white blood cells, or into the platelets. So all of this whole process is called hematopoiesis, or the production of any formed element. The production of specifically red blood cells from stem to red blood cell is specifically called erythropoiesis, erythropoiesis, because a red blood cell is called an erythrocyte, an erythrocyte. So, 
Um, erythropoiesis is the production of these red blood cells, and it takes about four days to do so. That's pretty much everything you need to know for that. Um, let's see. This is also important, where it says red blood cell production is stimulated by a low blood oxygen level. This is saying that, like, when you are maybe in the mountains or something where there's not a lot of oxygen, you're not going to be delivering as much oxygen to your cells um, because there's not going to be enough oxygen in the environment. So your body's going to respond by, by making more red blood cells in order to carry the oxygen. So, because the more red blood cells you have, the more carriers you have to deliver the oxygen. So that's what they mean when they say red blood cell production is stimulated by low blood oxygen levels, which typically result from decreased numbers of red blood cells, blah, blah, blah. This can happen with your environment or in situations when you're maybe doing endurance exercise, like running a mile, or <laughs> that might be a long distance exercise for some people like me, or for fit people, maybe like a marathon. But, um, yeah, so... Um, athletes tend to have like more uh, red blood cells than others do because they're constantly putting themselves in a low oxygen environment, which would cause their body to stimulate erythropoiesis. Now, how does it do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. The kidneys are the key player here. So the kidneys are going to be ones that are going to sense the decreased oxygen in your blood. And so they're going to be like, okay, kidneys, we got to do something. We need oxygen or else we're going to die. So, they, what they do is that they secrete a hormone called erythropoietin. Now, isn't that conveniently named? Now, the erythropoietin is going to travel into the, the bone, where the bone marrow is. And the bone marrow is actually going to be the ones that actually make new red blood cells. And the more red blood cells, blood cells you have, the more ability you have to, make to carry oxygen. So, it's going to end up with a, a result of increased blood oxygen. Now, this... A bone marrow thing is important. A lot of people sometimes donate blood marrow or bone marrow because maybe someone um, doesn't have enough red blood cells or whatever the case may have you, and so someone donates their red their um, bone marrow so that others can be able to make um, red blood cells and maybe white blood cells and all that stuff. So that's important. All right, so now here we are with a lovely another diagram and we're going to be talking a little bit about hemolysis again we talked about that a little bit hemolysis being um let me write that down again the lysis of or breaking down of the red blood cells so this diagram is showing you what you need to know about what happens when a red blood cell is broken down into pieces so you have an aged, abnormal, or damaged red blood cell, and basically they're going to die. And um, when they do so, they're going to the red blood cells are going to break down into their individual hemoglobin um, protein molecules. So they're all going to break down into those. Then from there, the hemoglobins are going to separate into their hemes and into their globins. So those two are going to separate. Um, what you really need to know is what happens to the heme, what happens to the globin at the end. So from here, the globins are going to break down further into amino acids. Now, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So just imagine that globin is like um, a wall, okay? I'll just draw a tiny little picture. Because proteins are, all have, um, are made of something. So let's say this is a globin. It's just shaped like that. And... It's made up of these individual blocks or bricks, which are going to be called amino acids. Think of them as maybe Legos. So these individual amino acids come together in a certain pattern to build a protein. So this whole thing would be a protein. And in this case, it is a, gl uh, a globin. It's hard to write and hold the camera. All right. So... What's going to happen is the globin is now going to break up into small pieces into separate amino acids. So now it's going to separate and each little block is going to go forth and find something else to do. So that's why it just has an arrow going off because these individual amino acids can be used to build other proteins like globins. It can be used to make anything. You can think of 
amino acids as like letters of the alphabet. Let me get a marker, it's easier. Um, so like, let's pretend that amino acids are like the letters of the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so forth. You use each one of these amino acids to build something. So let's say you want to build a word, like you want to build the word boat. So you need four different amino acids to build this protein, which is boat. Now when this protein gets broken down, you break it apart, you take the separate amino acids and take them to go somewhere else. Let's say you need to make another protein um, and you wanted to make a toe protein. T-O-E. So you would take this amino acid to build up a new protein. Or you might take the B from this one and spell, I don't know, a bird, <laughs> which is a different protein. So you can think of amino acids that way, as different letters that can be broken down and used to build all sorts of proteins. Anyway, back to on topic. Um, so, <clears throat> after the hemoglobin breaks up into heme and the globin, the globin goes off and breaks down into amino acids. The heme now, what you need to know really basically is that it converts into something called bilirubin. The bilirubin is then going to be um, going to the, the liver here. The f it just kind of gets stored there for now. And then at the end, it's going to be, the bilirubin is going to turn into some of the bile that the liver produces, and it's going to go into the small intestines and get excreted. Um, and this might be some kind of gross for some people, but if you're planning on being a nursing major, um, which most people are if they're taking this, then you're going to have to get used to it. Um, the book says that, you know, bile is excreted into the intestine, and then, you know, when you um, have a bowel movement uh, and your poop comes out, you know, it's like brownish color. And some of that has to do with the pigment originally from the hemoglobins, because remember they're like this dark reddish color. And um, if you've ever seen dried blood, it looks kind of brown. So that pigment carries through all the way into your little poopy, and that's part of the reason why your pigment of your bowels are that color. Aren't you glad you've learned that? Anyway, so one last thing is that the heme, part of it goes into the turns into bilirubin. The other part, remember we said iron was an important bil building block of the heme? The iron is also going to get stripped off because you're you're breaking it down to all its separate pieces. So the globin, the, the heme, and the iron. And the iron is going to basically go off and then go back to the bone marrow so that it can be used once again to build new red blood cells when erythropoiesis happens. Because remember that um, red blood cells are made from the bone marrow and that you need iron to build them so it's going to be recycled all the way back there. So essentially what you need to know is the end result. So you start with hemoglobin, it breaks into hemoglobin, the globin gets broken down to amino acids, the heme breaks into the heme and the iron, the iron goes back to the bone marrow, the, the heme turns into bilirubin which goes into the liver which secretes into bile which goes here and comes out. That's pretty much all you need to know. And that is essentially the all you need to know about red blood cells.